Hello again. Welcome to day two of week 25. Uh, on these day two readings, the last few weeks, we've been reading excerpts from the book Beginning to Pray by Metropolitan Anthony Bloom of Blessed Memory. Because this past Sunday was the Sunday of the Publican and the Pharisee, the beginning of the Triodion period, uh, it seems good to read uh, a reflection on how we should approach uh, the question of prayer in imitation of the publican. So this is what, uh, this is what he has to say. Um, what we must start with, if we wish to pray, is the certainty that we are sinners in need of salvation, that we are cut off from God, and that we cannot live without him, and that all we can offer God is our desperate longing to be made such that God will receive us, receive us in repentance, receive us with mercy and with love. And so from the outset, prayer is really our humble ascent towards God, a moment when we turn Godwards, shy of coming near, knowing that if we meet him too soon before his grace has had time to help us to be capable of meeting him, it will be judgment. And all we can do is to turn to him with all the reverence, all the veneration, the worshipful adoration, the fear of God of which we are capable, with all the attention and earnestness which we may possess, and ask him to do something with us that will make us capable of meeting him face to face, not for judgment, nor for condemnation, but for eternal life. I would like to remind you of the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. The publican comes and stands at the rear of the church. He knows that he stands condemned. He knows that in terms of justice there is no hope for him because he is an outsider to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of righteousness, or the kingdom of love because he belongs neither to the realm of righteousness nor to the realm of love. But in the cruel, the violent, the ugly life he leads, he has learned something of which the righteous Pharisee has no idea. He has learned that in a world of competition, in a world of predatory animals, in a world of cruelty and heartlessness, the only hope one can have is an act of mercy, an act of compassion, a completely unexpected act which is rooted neither in duty nor in natural relationships, which will suspend the action of the cruel, violent, heartless work and world in which we live. All he knows, for instance, from being himself an extortioner, a moneylender, a thief, and so forth, is that there are moments when, for no reason, because it is not part of the world's outlook, he will forgive a debt, because suddenly his heart has become mild and vulnerable, that on another occasion he may not get someone put into prison, because a face will have reminded him of something, or a voice has gone straight to his heart. There is no logic in this. It is not part of the world's outlook, nor is it a way in which he normally behaves. It is something that breaks through, which is completely nonsensical, which he cannot resist. And he knows also, probably, how often he himself was saved from final catastrophe by this intrusion of the unexpected and the impossible, by mercy, compassion, forgiveness. So he stands at the rear of the church, knowing that all the realm inside the church is a realm of righteousness and divine love to which he does not belong and into which he cannot enter. But he knows from experience also that the impossible does occur. And that is why he says, Have mercy. Break the laws of righteousness. Break the laws of religion. Come down in mercy to us who have no right to be either forgiven or allowed in. And I think that this is where we should start continuously all over again. There's something beautiful about this passage, and there's also something that we tend to really not like. We don't want to think of ourselves as being the publican. We don't want to be that person who is completely unworthy. And, you know, Metropolitan Anthony kind of emphasizes here, although he doesn't go into gory detail about it, but he emphasizes the reality of being a publican in these days. This wasn't just, you know, like, you know, he was an IRS, uh, you know, accountant or auditor, um, you know, a, a pencil pusher who, who had the destiny of, of many people in his hands and yet 
you know, probably never came into close contact with them and you know, didn't know what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. He would get up close and personal. He would, uh, you know, uh, tax collectors were, you know, they were the enforcers. They were the ones who were on the ground getting rich off of other people's deprivation and suffering. Um, this is not a good man. But he knows that he's not a good man. And what, what Metropolitan Anthony points out is is sometimes, even for evil men, there are moments of, of unexpected mercy. There are moments when, when he doesn't do what would be uh, expedient or profitable for him. And because he knows this, being all consumed by evil and yet still still recognizing, still possessing, well, still seeing strange flashes of humanity in himself. Because of this, he dares to ask for mercy, for a mercy that he doesn't have any right to, for a mercy that he doesn't have any expectation of, and yet he dares to ask. For us, as we think about praying to God, if we think honestly, even if we, we look righteous to everyone around us, we know. We know that we're sinful. We know that our motivations for being good are always mixed and, and, and complicated and, and have very little to do with actually wanting to please God. They have to be with being afraid, maybe. Uh, much more likely, they have to do with wanting other people to think that we're good, that we're pious, that we're devoted. And we do all of these things just for the sake of, of other people's other people's praise. It's a bad reason. And the way we treat other people, the way we talk about other people, the way we behave in our in our mind, in our heart, in our private actions, these are shameful. These are sinful things. Um, if we're honest, we know we don't have any right to demand mercy from God. The tendency for us then, if we recognize our unworthiness, the tendency is for us to turn away, to say, no, I don't deserve it. I'm just going to back away. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to get close to God. I, I, I don't have any business being here. And that's the wrong choice. The right choice, confessing, owning, realizing that we don't have any good reason to hope, not in ourselves. We don't have any right to anything to stop looking at ourselves. The goal, the point, the necessity is for us to stop looking at and obsessing over our own brokenness or, or trying to, you know, you know, make ourselves look better. Give that up and to look at God instead and taking hope in the fact that He tells us He is merciful, He tells us He is loving, then what we are supposed to do, the right thing for us to do, is to approach him and ask for mercy. Not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, not because we have a right to it, but precisely because we realize we don't. And that mercy is our only hope. Because if we can begin to pray in that way, this lens and all the time, then the Lord will hear us. This is his promise to us, but not because we deserve it, not because we earned it, not because we already possess it, but because he loves us, because he is abolishing the rule of, uh, of might makes right, the rule of whatever you, you can get away with, get away with, and even abolishing the rule of justice in his mercy and love. But only if we can repent. And repentance begins with recognizing that we don't deserve mercy and asking for it anyway. So uh, that's it for day two. God bless you all. I'll see you for Friday's reading.